I'm John McKee, editor of Messianic Apologetics, www.messianicapologetics.net. If you are new to the channel, be sure to subscribe for future teachings and updates. We want to thank everyone who is watching or listening to this episode of Messianic Insider, whether it's on YouTube, Facebook, iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spotify, or some other podcast venue. Messianic Insider is a podcast offering you something that your local Messianic congregation does not provide, a place to discuss critical and very deep issues which affect the future and stability of our faith community. We want to thank you for your regular support and donations of our ministry efforts. You can give online at outreachisrael.net forward slash support. Think about this for a moment. The future and stability of our faith community. Right now, the coronavirus, everyone seemingly in some kind of lockdown at home, not really going anywhere, that is what is on everyone's minds. And if people are paying attention to what is happening, because do I think that this coronavirus pandemic is going to reach biblical proportions, as it were, with uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions dead? No, I don't. However, this is a serious prompt for us to be considering when are we, not just in history, but on the proverbial timeline. Uh, we bill ourselves as the Messianic movement, as the end time move of God. So, this is, if anything else comes out of this, this is an excellent time for us to start talking about the end times. We really need to stop avoiding, uh, in, for, for some of us, uh, discussions about the end times. All too frequently, you know, we get into this uh, proverbial pattern of we just go to our Messianic congregation, we hear a teaching on Shabbat. Uh, it's going to be important for us. It's going to be uplifting and encouraging for us, but we really don't get into some of the controversies. And, you know, if, if you're in a Torah study or a home group study or something, you don't tend to focus on like, hey, who is the anti-Messiah, the Antichrist going to be? You know, do you think the false prophet could be, you know, Pope Francis or, or somebody else? Um, you know, oh my goodness, you know, I can just see, you know, down the road, everyone having to be tagged with a microchip so uh, we don't run out of toilet paper, right? I mean, these are some of the things that uh, I think a lot of people are thinking or they're reasoning with, but they don't necessarily uh, have the freedom to express it. Well, if anything else comes from this coronavirus uh, situation, people are going to start talking about the end times. And I know that for a lot of people, well, I'll just deal with the book of Revelation when we get there. I'm, or I'm not really pre-trib or post-trib. I'm just pan-trib. It'll all pan out in the end. Uh, I mean, that's like uh, so, so many fathers when they find out that their wives have gone into labor. Now, what was that book I was supposed to read about child rearing? You know, how am I supposed to burp the baby? How am I supposed to change the diaper? Um, we don't want to be waiting until the very last minute to be discussing the end times. And, and I know that all of us in our uh, faith experience. You know, we've heard false end time predictions made. Uh, we've heard people uh, make a claim about, you know, 88 reasons why he's coming in 1988. Uh, very early on in my own family's messianic experience, I remember hearing a teaching that very, uh, a very compelling teaching, in fact, that very forthrightly declared that on September the 23rd, 1993, on the White House lawn, when uh, Bill Clinton was president with Yitzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat, and they signed the Middle East Peace Accord, that that initiated the seven-year tribulation period. And, and of course, uh, how many years ago was that? Uh, that was 
uh, at least three and a half tribulation periods ago. So uh, we've all seen a lot of abuse with the end times. We've seen a lot of hype and sensationalism, people just wanting to sell books, get a name for themselves. But in terms of getting ready for the final stretch of history, being a part of the Messianic movement, the end time move of God, uh, and this coronavirus alert, there are going to be people who really want to talk about the end times. Now, uh, this is something that I myself have come and go gone with. Uh, I have come and gone with wanting to talk about the end times, wanting to talk about prophecy, when are we in history, uh, the anti-Messiah, the false prophet, uh, the judgments, uh, what we're supposed to be doing, this kind of thing. I, I myself have been like, oh, I just don't want to deal with it. Let's go find something that uh, we can all unite around. But I'm paying attention to this as well. To just uh, get us kind of started uh, on this whole thing about Messianics in the end times. In our ministry's publication, The Messianic Walk, which is subtitled The End Time Move of God. So this gives you a fair acclamation to many of the things that uh, you encounter in the Messianic movement. In one of the last chapters, and look, I am of course, responsible for this as the author, uh, navigating through a very small messianic movement. I talk, I have a large paragraph. It makes up about a third of a page, but this is all I really talk about when it comes to the end times. All of us who have been involved with the messianic movement for any elongated period of time are aware of our collective interest in the anticipated end times. Because of our focus on Israel and the Jewish people, it is hardly a surprise that we pay attention to the Middle East and when we are in human history. There are certainly debates, although much friendlier today in 2018, it's 2020 now, uh, than they were 20 years ago, on whether Yeshua returns to gather the Holy Ones before or after the Tribulation period. There are different orientations witnessed among those who are convinced that we are living in the end times with some of the conviction that the return of the Messiah is much closer than others and should what they do or not do with their lives be reflective of this. Certainly, if the Messianic movement is to be a significant venue of future Jewish salvation and it's seeing many non-Jewish believers tangibly connect to their faith heritage and Israel's scriptures, then some evaluation of what we can legitimately do for the future would be in order. We might be able to take some solace from Daniel 12, 3, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavenly expanse, and those who turn many to righteousness will be like the stars forever and ever, a tree of life version. So that's kind of what we only talk about when it comes to the end times in the Messianic walk. Now, I have written other things, uh, books like When Will the Messiah Return, uh, Israel in Future Prophecy, uh, our commentary on uh, first and second Thessalonians. So I have written about eschatology, prophecy, more than just this. And, and we'll be talking about this uh, not only today, but in future shows as well. Many of you are familiar with my family's story about getting into the Messianic movement uh, in 1995. Uh, very, very briefly, uh, my late father, Kimball McKee, uh, was a Sunday school teacher. Uh, he was a lay minister in the United Methodist Church Kentucky Conference, which was still evangelical back in the 1980s. Uh, and he brought in a lot of like Jewish roots types of things into his Sunday school class uh, and into, into his, in his teachings, particularly uh, things from Zola Levitt. Uh, so like the season that's coming up, the Passover, was a very big time for him in, in terms of teaching on the uh, faith heritage that believers uh, have in, in, the, in the Tanakh scriptures. Uh, my father died in 1992 of cancer. Uh, my mother got reconnected with Mark Huey, my stepfather, in 1993. They were married in 1994. We moved to Dallas for the first time and did not quite knowing what religious sector we were going to be involved with. Uh, he was not going to get plugged into the Methodist church. My mother was not going to get plugged in, into some dispensational Bible church. Uh, 
we actually started uh, participating in the in the charismatic movement and then that eventually led to them going on a Zola Levitt tour to Israel at the end of 1994 by the fall of 1995 August, September, that time frame, we were being pulled into the Messianic Jewish movement. So that's a very brief encapsulation of how we got involved in the Messianic movement. But about a month before we started getting pulled into the Messianic movement as a family, started attending a Messianic Jewish congregation during the fall high holidays, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, uh, we went through a really big change as a family. Uh, customarily up until this time, uh, when issues in Bible study uh, had centered around prophecy, the end times, uh, we were n not that far off from a lot of just the customary dispensational pre-tribulation rapture perspectives that you still continue to see uh, out there. Now, at the time in the uh, early to mid-1990s, this was before the whole Left Behind series uh Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins got released, so we were more influenced by the Third Millennium book. Um, I haven't read that in a long time. I don't even know if we still have it. Uh, it may not have survived some of the moves, but that was the kind of fiction literature that uh, influenced me and influenced a lot of my peers uh, in high school. So uh, we're getting pulled into the Messianic community the fall high holidays, 1995, but about a month before that, uh, all of us in the family had become, how do I just say that? I should just come out and say this. All of us became post-tribulationists right before going into the Messianic movement. And there were some uh, different ways that this was happening. Uh, some uh, some of us were just like, look, I don't know why I, I feel led to study all these prophecies about the return of the Lord and revelation. I mean, what's the whole point if we're not going to be here? With me, it was very simple. I was... Uh, I started a new regimen of uh, devotions in the morning. I started reading uh, one chapter of the Gospels every morning, then writing a, a page of notes or, or something. And, of course, you start with the Gospel of Matthew. You get to the Olivet Discourse of Matthew 24. And I encountered verses 29 to 31. Matthew 24, 29 to 31. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. So when I encountered that passage, which I had never read before, I, having been raised on pre-tribulation, rapture teaching, dispensational teaching about the end times. Uh, I, I've been familiar with uh, some of the 1970s movies like uh, A Thief in the Night. Some of you are familiar with that where uh, the husband disappears, he gets raptured, uh, and his electric razor is still uh, on in the, uh, in the sink. You know, it's, it's still buzzing. Uh, having seen those verses from Matthew 24, 29 to 31, I was really just shaken, like, where's the pre-tribulation rapture here? This says after the tribulation of those days, this gathering of the saints, the holy ones, takes place. And I was really quite um, intrigued. I wasn't upset. I was intrigued. And I knew that I needed to go do some further research myself on this. Uh, I didn't consider, you know, pre-tribulationism to be this gross, false teaching and pre-tribulation people to be unsaved, but I knew deep in my spirit that I needed to go do some more homework. Now, uh, this was before any of the things that I would get into in later years with having a website and talking about apologetics and theology and everything. Uh, I had to go to my uh, my parents' very limited theological library, very limited selection of books on prophecy. And I, and I started reading things, if you can believe it, as a 15-year-old, uh, like The Blessed Hope by George Eldon Ladd, a biblical study of the second advent and the rapture. This is a classic uh, evangelical post-tribulational book, and it gets into the debate on pre-versus-post-trib. Another book, a little more technical, uh, 
The Church in the Tribulation, a, a Biblical Examination of Post-Tribulationism by Robert H. Gundry. This is another classic uh, book representing the post-tribulational perspective from uh, uh, the, the whole debate that, that does take place in evangelicalism. And then later, this was released in 1997, uh, but it's a lot easier to read than Church in the Tribulation. This is called First the Antichrist by uh, Bob Gundry as well. And I picked this up when I was in college. Uh, so uh, those two books, a little technical, uh, but I was able to, you know, read through them, get familiar with pre versus post trib. Uh, and I remember uh, I was attending a Christian school at the time. I remember in, st in study hall, uh, this is when uh, people were reading books like the third millennium. The Left Behind series had just been announced. I'm not sure if it started to hit, but you know, people were talking about the rapture. And, of course, living in Dallas, uh, many people uh, represented the pre-tribulational dispensational perspective because we've got Dallas Theological Seminary right in our backyard. Uh, and believe it or not, one of the teachers who was in charge of the study hall said, well, I don't believe that. I'm a post-tribulationist. And I was like, oh. And I kind of announced to the class or the study hall, uh, I'm a post-tribulationist too. And some people are like, oh, that's rather interesting. Others are like, I can't believe that. You know, I want to go off and get married and have a career and have a family and have a life. I don't want to have to go through those difficult things. And you're really kind of taken aback. You're like, oh my goodness. Um, you know, people are basically imposing things on God regarding their lives and what they want to see uh, happen with their lives, which of course is something that we can't do as God. As followers of the Messiah, we have to, uh, thy will on earth as it is in heaven. Um, we have to live our lives according to God's plan uh, for us and for the world. Later on in my studies, another book, um, this isn't so much a, a theological book regarding pre versus post trib, but uh, it's a good study just the same. It's called, it's The Rapture Plot by Dave McPherson. And it goes into some of the historical development of pre-tribulationism uh, with the visions of Margaret MacDonald in Scotland. Uh, and then how the Plymouth Brethren and John Nelson Darby picked up on it. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a worthwhile read uh, for those of you who want to get into the pre versus post-trib debate. Uh, being thrust into the Messianic Jewish world, 1995-1996, and with it being prompted to consider so many things, um, and we've talked about this in our in our different books and our different resources. You know, being prompted to consider things uh, as we are consciously embracing our faith heritage in Israel scriptures, we're getting plugged into the Messianic way of life. Uh, you know, we're going through things like, okay, oh. What about kosher? Is it for us? And uh, how do we not offend people when we bring meals to the congregation? And, of course, we went through the, the pattern of, you know, we threw out all of this unclean stuff in our uh, refrigerator and pantry and freezer. Uh, and, you know, we're also considering a new cycle of holidays. We're really not doing Christmas. Uh, Easter, we just are just, we're not really doing the bunny thing. We're remembering the resurrection in the context of the Passover. We're, we're, we're doing a lot more. And among all these changes that we're being prompted to really embrace, it's only logical that the Lord would have us be considering a new model of eschatology. Uh, and along with that, as we're reconnecting to Israel, we're connecting to the Messianic Jewish mission of Jewish outreach and Jewish evangelism, uh, we're having to consider, well, uh, maybe we are going through the end times and maybe we're going to go through the tribulation period and maybe we really are going to have to stand with the Jewish people who may be going through another Holocaust in the future. And if, if they are going through another Holocaust in the future, we will be right beside them and we will stand with them. So we're going through a lot of these changes, 1995, 1996. Uh, I never considered the whole pre versus post trib rapture debate as, as vehement as it can get sometimes, as, as uh, tense as it can get, and people can be, you know, they, they can raise their voice, and they can get angry at one another. I never considered it a salvation issue. I never considered 
pre-tribulationists. I don't consider pre-tribulationists to be heretics. I think they've got some things that are um, off, but there are plenty of things that we do agree on, in fact, with prophecy. Uh, I don't think that all dispensational views of the tribulation period or the uh, identity of the anti-Messiah or the false prophet or the 144,000 are all wet. Uh, of course, we do. We always need to have discussions about these kinds of things. We need to be able to revise our uh, our positions. We need to be able to fine tune things. Uh, but in the Messianic Jewish world, 1995-1996, it was overwhelmingly pre-tribulational. Overwhelmingly. Now there are there were certainly uh, various leaders of note who were post-tribulationists. Uh, but we really just didn't talk about this. But as we got closer and closer to the turn of the millennium, the year 2000, more people started to talk about this. And in the uh, 2000 aughts, and definitely by today, you don't see the Messianic Jewish movement, at least, being overwhelmingly pre-trib. You don't see it being you know, 85 to 95 percent pre-trib. Uh, some would say that it's 50 to 60 percent post-trib now. I think it's probably more like 49, 51 in that range, pre versus post trib. But uh, nobody is going to accuse the other side of being heretics. Uh, but we know that we have to probably resume some of these discussions about when does the Lord return? Uh, have we really interpreted some passages the right way? But there are definitely uh, dispensational perspectives on many issues that I agree with. Uh, a number of dispensational books that I will consult from time to time, at least for information, uh, are books like The Rapture Question by John Wolvert. Uh, one book I have learned actually a lot from is The Nations, Israel, and the Church in Prophecy, also by John Wolvert. Uh, so there are plenty of things that we can agree on regarding the different phenomena that are supposed to take place in the 70th week of Israel, the abomination of desolation. Dispensationalists are not all wet on everything. Uh, we need to consider what they have uh, done with different passages. And, and as with all things, we might find that uh, they're, they're, they're accurate. Other things we may find that need to be fine-tuned, and other things uh, they just need to be thrown out, and we need to reconsider different phenomena. So uh, it's not as though dispensationalists don't have anything to share with the conversation on the end times. They do. And many of us as we move forward in time now, are going to be prompted to consider many different aspects of uh, the tribulation period. Now, uh, by the end of the 1990s, as we approached the year 2000, there were a number of other resources that got released. And, and this is the kind of sensationalistic literature which uh, I think a lot of us want to avoid. Uh, we, we can see uh, by, the, by the title, we can see by the cover, we can see by what's being talked about this is the kind of book that's pretty much only intended to help somebody get a name for himself. One of these books is called The Antichrist and a Cup of Tea. Some of you may have this. Uh, and on the cover is a coat of arms of a particular member of European royalty. When I tell you who it is, you'll recognize it immediately. Uh, but uh, this uh, book was based on the uh, premise that you could take the Roman alphabet, the English alphabet, and apply the numerical values of gematria seen in Hebrew to uh, the, the Roman American alphabet. And then all of these names of world leaders were put into a computer program, and there was one name that came up as 666. Uh, and that name was actually uh, the, 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 the person Prince Charles of Wales. Uh, and and then you you pull off his personal coat of arms and you see things like you know the red dragon oh okay I mean you know this is a servant of Satan here and, and all this and then uh, this this author uh, put all this research in and he wrote a book that is almost four it's 444 pages so it's almost 450 pages and this is from 1998 mind you uh, and uh, just made some of these claims that you know Prince Charles is definitely you know as far as we can tell. He is going to be the anti-Christ. He is going to be the man of lawlessness. Now, uh, I think a lot of people today would be rather dismissive of Prince Charles as the anti-Messiah. But, I mean, you never know. But th those are the kinds of things that we do need to be very, very careful of. More academically, uh, a book like this. This is the 1996 edition, Three Views on the Rapture, uh, Pre-Tribulation, 
mid 70th week post tribulation uh, the, this is the kind of study that we need to be having as messianic people not that we aren't going to speculate on who the uh, anti-messiah or false prophet might be and uh, about a year ago a very very good book got released uh, by michael brown and craig keener not afraid of the antichrist why we don't believe in the pre-tribulation rapture uh, so many of you are familiar with michael brown jewish objections to jesus uh, you follow uh, his work uh, certainly some of the things that he's done regarding the uh, homosexual and transgender agenda uh, he came out with a book last year that was very hard line against the pre-tribulation rapture now he he and craig keener uh, disagree with the pre-tribulation rapture in a friendly academic way it's not as though they hate pre-tribulationists they know that a lot of people who follow them are pre-tribulationists but as the title suggests, we should not be afraid of the anti-Messiah. We need to enter into a season now as Messianic people where we can recognize when we are and appeal to the Lord for, okay, when are we? What do we need to be doing? What, what business do we have to take care of with you, Lord, personally and familially, so we can now be released to make a difference while we still can? Uh, to me, that's the most important part of all of us considering when we are in human history, uh, Messianics and the end times, uh, what we need to be doing. And there are going to be things that have to be discussed as a result of this. And they may not necessarily involve prophecy. They may involve some of the things we talked about last time about millennials and the issues that millennials have with the Bible, with God, with their lives, who they are, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but it all is taking place in this overall narrative of we're getting closer and closer to Yeshua's return. And that is something that a lot of people don't want to really be considering, uh, even though they should. We'd like to bill ourselves as the end time move of God. In light of this whole coronavirus scare, it's probably time that we begin acting like it. How are we going to be addressing prophecy? Uh, in my notes here, I've just put you know three simple points that I think can help us as we have discussions and have as we open up the conversation among different people and among different points of view. Uh, the first thing is we've got to resume some kind of discussion about pre versus post trib. We have to, because that can, that can very much change your orientation to prophecy. Do you think you're just going to be beamed out of here and then, uh, God has to beat up on the Jewish people and have them experience Holocaust too in order to receive Yeshua as their Messiah. There are people who believe that. I don't believe that. Uh, I believe that when calamity comes, it's supposed to draw us to our eternal God for deliverance and for help. But we're going to have to resume discussions about pre versus post trib. Uh, the second thing is uh, we will have to evaluate common assumptions about the tribulation period. Uh, you know, what is the tribulation period about? What is the abomination of desolation? Who is the anti-Messiah? Who is the false prophet? Who are the 144,000? Uh, does the book of Revelation and these prophecies, do they take place in a strict sequential order? Or is it more like a symphony of judgments? Um, we can have some uh, good conversations there and not, you know, paint ourselves into a proverbial corner. Oh, it has to be this way. Like one of the uh, debates that I, I think it's crazy. One of these debates that's taking place now is, is the anti-Messiah going to be European or is it, or is it going to be Islamic? I ultimately don't know, but I don't want to unnecessarily exclude either position because I know that we can be shocked uh, when the guy shows up and like, I never saw that coming. Uh, we don't want to end up in that kind of a position. So when you talk about some of the specifics of the tribulation period, you need to be somewhat loose. Uh, on and, uh, and this leads to my third point, and we'll close with this. Be flexible on some details. Remember how uh, many in the Second Temple uh, world of Judaism, they had certain expectations for the arrival of the Messiah. And many people missed Yeshua of Nazareth when he showed up. So we don't want to see that happen again when we are anticipating the return or the second coming of Yeshua the Messiah. So we need to be flexible on some details. Uh, we need not uh, be caught saying it has to be this way and then 
history manifests uh, in another way. Okay, uh, next time on Messianic Insider, we will continue our discussion, Messianics and the End Times. Uh, I'm sure the Lord will uh, let me know what we're going to be talking about specifically uh, next time, but we are going to continue this discussion, Messianics and the End Times, because I think we've all been prompted very gently, but we've been prompted nevertheless through this coronavirus uh, crisis. You need to start talking about end time prophecy. Uh, this is absolutely imperative for the future of, of our Messianic faith community. You can't wait until the last minute uh, to start uh, talking about the return of Yeshua. Uh, we can't all of a sudden think, well, it'll, it'll just pan out in the end. No, we've been given the time to have these discussions and we need to have them. If you all found this content enjoyable and useful, please be sure to drop a thumbs up for this teaching. As always, we thank you for your continued support of our ministry's efforts. God bless and shalom, and we'll see you again soon. You can donate online at outreachisrael.net forward slash support. In the meantime, be sure to check us out, www.messianicapologetics.net.